Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Attorney General T.J. Donovan. Uh, I am joined uh, by Jill Abrams uh, from my office, as well as Rose Hayes, who's the investigator. Uh, Kate Van Hayes from Senator Bernie Sanders' office is here, as well as Bob Bick uh, from the Howard Center. Bob, I want to thank you and your team for hosting us again here at the Howard Center uh, to announce another lawsuit uh, in our effort uh, to address the opiate crisis in our state. Uh, let me say this before I begin about uh, the Howard Center. They have been on the front lines before anyone in addressing the opiate crisis uh, in this state. They have expend expended significant resources in addressing the opiate crisis in this state. They have saved thousands of lives in this state. They were the first voices to call for treatment, to expand the hub and spoke model, to create the methadone clinic and open the doors to the methadone clinic, to argue and advocate for medically assistant to treatment and to advocate for the dignity of all people, uh, especially those who suffer with addiction. So Bob, I wanna thank you and your team for all that you have done uh, for this community, for those that who have suffered from addic uh, addiction uh, and for setting an example uh, for fearless advocacy on this issue uh, of the opiate epidemic in our state, so thank you. Uh, today, uh, I'm proud to announce that the state of Vermont is suing uh, the Sackler family uh, for uh, deceptive acts, unfair and deceptive conduct, nuisance and un unjust enrichment for the, ro the role they played in promoting these deceptive acts uh, to spread and sell Oxycontin uh, throughout our state. We filed a case against eight individual members of the Sackler family who personally participated in and directed the misconduct of Purdue Pharma, the manufacturer of highly addictive Oxycontin. As I said, we sued for unfair and deceptive conduct, nuisance, and unjust enrichment. These eight members of the Sackler family, they served as officers or directors of Purdue between 1996 and 2018 and oversaw the deceptive marketing campaign that led to an explosion in opiate prescribing and opiate, the opiate crisis in Vermont. They made billions of dollars as a result of this. The Sackler family managed the company's core business activities, marketing, sales, and product development of opiates. They directed and authorized the company's deceptive strategy to minimize the health risk associated with opiates and deceptively claimed that prescription opiates were rarely the cause of death of addiction, abuse, or misuse. The Sacklers directed and approved hiring sales representatives whose job was to visit doctors and persuade them to prescribe more opiates, higher, dose of, higher doses of opiates, and for longer periods of time. They did this in Vermont. They also devised several additional unconscionable schemes to fortify their market. They directed sales representatives to expand the market to new and vulnerable populations, the elderly and the opioid naive, those who had not previously used these powerful drugs. They directed their sales representatives to promote an ever-increasing escalation of doses to increase the sales of produce more expensive products without adequately explaining that patients who use opiates become physically dependent on them and require higher doses to achieve the same level of pain relief and that increased opiate doses carry higher health and addiction risks. And they directed sales representatives to promote and distribute opiate saving cards, which provided substantial price discounts for the express purpose of inducing, of inducing patients to continue to use opiates long term. They received detailed briefings on the size, distribution, daily activities, and compensation of their opiates sales force. They were engaged in this deception on a daily basis. They were active participants in this deception that has devastated and impacted thousands of Vermonters' lives. The Sackler family members who we sue today and their positions are as follows. Richard Sackler, who was the board member from 1990 to 2018. He was the co-chair of the board in 2003 and remained co-chair until he left the board in 2018. He was Purdue's head of research and development from 1990 through 1999 and he was the president and CEO of Purdue from 1999 through 2003. Jonathan Sackler, he joined the board in 1990 and remained on the board until 2018. He was a vice president.
Kathy Sackler. She was a board member from 1990 to 2018. She was a vice president. Eileen Sackler Lefcourt, board member from 1990 to 2018. Mortimer D.A. Sackler, he was a board member from 1993 to 2018. Teresa Sackler, a board member from 1993 to 2018. And David Sackler, a board member from 2012 to 2018. And finally, Beverly Sackler, who was a board member from 1993 to 2017. This is our third lawsuit that we've brought in the state of Vermont in regards to the opiate crisis in the state. As you know, we sued Purdue Pharma as a corporation. We sued uh, as well as two other corporations. But I want to be clear about the Sacklers. They made billions of dollars off the backs of patients who became addicted to Oxycontin. They made billions of dollars. They entire Sackler family has been unjustly enriched by their misdeeds, but our lawsuit only names the Sackler family board members who served on the board of directors between 1993 and 2017 because these eight individuals that I previously named were officers or directors of Purdue Pharma during that relevant time period. The evidence shows that they were deeply involved in running the company. As one, Purdue's, as one of Purdue's prior CEOs said, the board of directors in which these eight Sackler family members were on functioned as the de facto CEO. That's why we sue the Sacklers today. Uh, with that, let me turn it over uh, to Kate Van Haste uh, from Senator Bernie Sanders' office, uh, who is here uh, to announce efforts by Senator Sanders and others in the United States Senate to address the opiate crisis. Thanks very much. On behalf of Senator Sanders, thanks for having me here today. Um, so first, let me just uh, agree with the Attorney General. Bob, you and all of your staff at the Howard Center are doing tremendous work that is critically important to the welfare and the safety and the ability of Vermonters to thrive. And you guys have been really on the front of this effort. And we are where we are today. And we know what we know because of your work. And you have some phenomenal clients, and I think it's important to recognize them as well. Um, these are wonderful members of our community, and you are helping them to thrive in our community. And so together, I think what we want to do is maybe give you a little less work to do, <laughs> maybe have your team be able to focus on some of the other good work that needs to happen in this state. Um, from Bernie's perspective, we have got to get out ahead of this crisis a little bit better. Congress has done a good job on a bipartisan effort to put some money into treatment. Um, we have federal funding to provide treatment to folks, but that is not enough. We have to start looking at prevention efforts to make sure that more and more people don't become addicted to these powerful medications. Part of that effort is making sure that drug companies cannot market to these people and cannot participate in these illegal practices. So we really appreciate the work of the Attorney General and his office to highlight the role that individuals play in this problem because from Senator Sanders' perspective, corporations can also often hide behind that corporate name, but we know that there are people making these decisions and these people need to be held accountable for what they are doing to the rest of our country. So Senator Sanders today is going to be introducing legislation with Senator Bennett and others in the United States Senate titled the Opioid Crisis Accountability Act. And part of what that legislation does is to prohibit the illegal marketing and distribution practices that happen today that we're talking about. Right now, these drug companies bake in fines into their cost of doing business. They expect to get fined by the Justice Department. They consider it part of the cost of doing business. That has to stop. We have to make the repercussions of their illegal activities mean something. So we are also going to make them reimburse the federal government for the economic impact, the damage that they have caused. We spend billions and billions of dollars of federal funding every year cleaning up the mess that these companies cause, and we have to hold them accountable. Another thing we're going to do in this legislation that Senator Sanders is introducing today is to reduce the period of exclusivity that these brand companies have on their products. Right now, brand, manu brand ma name manufactured drugs have an exclusive hold on the market from upwards of seven years. 
we are going to say once and for all that if you participate in illegal practices, you are not going to have that close hold on the market any longer. You're going to lose that. And that is one thing that these drug companies are not prepared for. And finally, the legislation that Senator Sanders is introducing is going to put forward a penalty for the development of opioid medications that are developed with federal funding. Because right now, most of these drug companies use federal research dollars to come up with the research and development of these drugs. We need to say again that if you participate in these illegal activities, if you create drugs, lie about the impact on the American people, you're going to have to reimburse the federal government for the funding that was provided to you in taxpayer dollars. And you're also going to have to pay a fine. So the legislation imposes a, up to a 25 percent total amount on the profit of, from these drugs that those corporations will have to pay back to the federal taxpayer. So Senator Sanders is appreciative of the work that's happening right now to address this crisis, and we're happy to work together to make even more strides moving forward. So thanks very much for having me here today on behalf of Senator Sanders. Thank you, Kate. Thank uh, to Senator Sanders uh, for his continued leadership on this issue. Uh, the two other corporations that we've sued are McKesson and Cardinal Health. Uh, those lawsuits were filed uh, in Chittenden County Superior Court, uh, as this lawsuit uh, will be as well, or has was earlier this morning. Um, I just want to make one last point about Bob Bick and the team at Howard. None of this, none of this work that we're doing in this state whether it's the hub and spokes, whether it's the lawsuit, whether it's alternatives to the criminal justice system, whether it's addressing uh, addiction as a disease, uh, none of this would have happened uh, but for the leadership of Howard, really being uh, the moral uh, voice on uh, the dignity of each individual, uh, those that suffer from addiction, that it is a disease. And that really created the environment, uh, I think, uh, in this state that has led Vermont uh, to do more than most. Uh, we still have a long way to go, um, uh, but a lot of the efforts that, it, frankly, is being emulated uh, in other states, uh, it started here with the leadership from the folks at, at Howard. So thank you. Uh, with that, happy to take questions. Uh, how much are you seeking in this lawsuit? You know, there's never a specific uh, dollar amount that we would ask but as we talked about the Sackler family being unjustly enriched across this nation including Vermont they made billions of dollars and we're looking uh, to disgorge that money uh, as a result of that unjust enrichment. So I'm going to update on the other um, litigation that's going on? Well we in the lawsuit against that we brought against Purdue Pharma, which was our first lawsuit, they filed a motion to dismiss. Uh, we were successful. We won that. Uh, with that, let me, though, turn it over to Jill Abrams, who has done a tremendous job uh, from my office and being the lead attorney uh, on these uh, lawsuits to give you an update uh, in terms of what's happening here in Vermont. Uh, but as uh, you all know as well, uh, there is a multi-state investigation which Vermont is playing a leadership role in. So, Jill. So, um, in the Purdue lawsuit, we're in the stage called discovery. So, um, we and um, Purdue will exchange documents. Um, there will be depositions, and we'll proceed towards trial. So that that process is ongoing. And with respect to the McKesson and Cardinal lawsuit, because that one is recently filed. We're just starting. We expect to see motions to dismiss, which we feel pretty confident we win. Do you expect to see any um, further suits down the line from any, or is this maybe the last? We're, we're keeping our options open. Okay. Thank you. So this loss, um, TJ, this lawsuit yeah. is directed at individuals, which is yes. individuals is different. I mean, the previous two are the companies, yes. um, and you're already suing Purdue Pharma. Yes. Why are you going after individuals? Because the Sacklers, as I said, directed the company in their capacity as board members. They acted as the de facto CEO and directed not only the deceptive marketing, but the deployment of sales, force, sales forces into the state of Vermont to deceive Vermonters that these drugs were not as harmful, were not as addictive, would not cause death 
when in fact they did. That's the deception. Why? And they, they directed the company. That's why we sue them today in a capacity as board members uh, in the state of Vermont, uh, the eight of them. And uh, when we talk about unjust enrichment, they made billions of dollars here. People, Vermonters have died. We know stories, not only of those who have lost their lives, but folks who are fighting every single day to regain not only their sobriety, uh, but their dignity and their, and their way in life as a result of this addiction that started, frankly, from these prescription drugs. It was a prescription drug crisis in this state before it was a heroin crisis, before it was a fentanyl crisis. It was a prescription drug crisis in this state, which was Oxycontin, which was manufactured by Purdue Pharma, which was directed by the Sackler family. TJ, for those of us who aren't, you know, legal experts by any means, when you sue the company, Purdue Pharma, yep. aren't you technically suing the board? So where's the difference sure. really between the two, between the one that you sued now and um, the Purdue Pharma, aren't they kind of intertwined? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I'm having Jill answer that question. As you said, as you asked for the legal expert. <laughs> Here's the legal expert. They are intertwined. One is a corporate entity and, and the other is individual, so it gives us multiple places to go for money. So with respect to both, we're um, suing for unfair and deceptive acts and practices. Um, and for nuisance with respect to the Sacklers for unjust enrichment. So it's a way essentially to reach into the pocket of the individual wrongdoer. So um, if one of those individuals say um, made a billion dollars in a given year, we would have access to that billion dollars individually separate and apart from what the company as a separate corporate legal entity would contribute to a, to a lawsuit. No. Would the company and the individuals, even though they're separate lawsuits, could they have the same sort of defense, or do you anticipate different defense? They, they may. We, we'll, we'll see pretty soon, I think. <laughs> Can you follow up on that? When you were bringing the false lawsuit against the company, do you consider also bringing these individual lawsuits at that time? Do you have these people in individual capacity? And if not, I guess, did anything change to bring you? Sure. So, so we set our sights on um, doing the investigation of the corporation first. Um, when you do an investigation like this, especially one that is over a lot of years and is pretty complex, you're literally looking at millions of pages of documents. Um, and so it was really important for us to get the first lawsuit filed and be able to continue our investigation against the individual so we felt that we were at a at the right place now having having reviewed the documents carefully to name the individuals as well i want to add one point to that and, and which has been reported about purdue farm as the corporate entity filing for bankruptcy um i won't offer an opinion uh, whether they do that or not, but by suing the Sacklers separately, we'll be able to keep pressure on the most culpable family members, uh, even if uh, the filing and bankruptcy court should come uh, from Purdue as a corporation. A number of the lawsuits that have been filed in the opioid yep. crisis by you know, states are multiple state. Is the yes. lawsuit that you filed today against the Sacklers only Vermont? Or yes. Do you have other states? No, it's just Vermont. Um, the state of Vermont filing suit against these eight Sacklers. It was just the state of Vermont suing Purdue uh, and McKesson and Cardinal Health. Uh, as we said earlier, we are part of the multi-state investigation uh, with 40 uh, some odd other states looking at the distributors and the manufacturers. So if, if, if another state said we agree with you regarding the Sacklers. Could they join you on the lawsuit? They would have to, and they have. Other states have sued some Sackler family members. I know Massachusetts has, for, for an example. Um, uh, but, you know, it's based on the facts in each individual case and the issue of jurisdiction. Now, um, if it's already been said in other press conferences, I apologize. But it it where, probably has. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> where is the money going to go if, hypothetically, you were to win these suits? Where, where do you think it would go? Uh, 
I'd probably get in trouble for this, but let me say it anyways. And this is, um, I, I, I don't want to talk specific about this lawsuit or any lawsuit. Um, I think if, if there is a recovery, the people that have been on the front lines, like Howard, need to be, uh, the, I think the funds need to be directed towards the folks that are out in the community helping people every single day, saving people's lives, getting people healthy, getting people back on the road to recovery. It's not just addiction, it's mental health too. Um, and I'd like to see the money directed towards uh, organizations like Howard. I'd like to see the money directed towards prevention, towards treatment, towards intervention. We're not, as has been stated often, we're not gonna arrest our way out of this issue. This is a public health issue. It is not a public safety issue by itself. Because of it's a public health crisis, there are public safety consequences. But at its core, this is a public health issue, and it should be directed to public health organizations like the Howard Center. Bob, I don't know if you want to offer a few words on that. Generally speaking. <laughs> Generally speaking, um, Howard Center is always pleased to receive funding to support the work that we do. Um, if, in fact, there's a recovery, then I would imagine that those dollars, were they to come to Howard Center and other treatment providers throughout the state, it would relieve pressure on the state's general fund, and then those dollars could be used for other social programs to meet needs of other communities. Could you give us just a sense of how things are going? I don't know, Bob or TJ, you know, how are things going in terms of our efforts to reduce fatalities, overdoses? I know Chicken County has made some progress. I wondered if you could just advance the uh, conversation. Right, I, you know, the, the, um, the difficulty is when we look at the data, we're looking at moments in time. Um, right now, I think we are making significant progress. I think it's fair to say that we're not seeing a huge increase in the number of new individuals that are struggling with an opioid um, use problem. But we still have a very significant number of individuals in this state who um, are actively using and will ultimately need to um, enter into the treatment system over time. Why do you think that's the case? That there is still a significant number of individuals? That we haven't seen an increase in the number of people. Is it education that the general public is picking up on? Is it the doctors that are no longer prescribing opioids? Why are we not, you know, why is that increase diminishing? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a complex, there's a, it's a complex answer. I think there are multiple factors. Certainly, I think uh, the uh, outreach and education efforts have had an impact. The awareness of the issue of, uh, is certainly a factor. Um, the uh, actions that the state has taken with regard to the uh, prescription monitoring system and the changes in um, prescription prescribing practices have really, for the most part, taken prescription opioids off the table. So now we're dealing with the consequences of that, as TJ um, had alluded to. But, um, you know, there's no magic bullet. Um, I think one of the things that we all recognize, for those of us that have been doing this for a long time, is that substance use and abuse patterns run in cycles, and that for a period of time, depressant-type drugs tend to be uh, predominant, and then they cycle in stimulant drugs like uh, methamphetamine and cocaine, um, become more dominant than they kind of um, cycle on a sine wave that um, opposes each other. And we are seeing, uh, as the state has indicated, um, some data to suggest um, an increase in stimulant abuse, uh, uh, like cocaine and methamphetamine, not just nationally, but here in Vermont. Um, the most disturbing aspect of that is that um, those drugs are now also um, uh, in involve fentanyl. So it still raises the uh, untoward outcome of um, uh, sudden death. This is a public question for Jill. How long has this investigation been going on? Um, over two years. How long do you think it will take for it to work through the courts, either to a settlement or to a you know, jury? Um, 
Well, in the Purdue case, um, we just submitted and the judge approved an order which sets out what's going to happen each step along the way in our case against Purdue, and we have a trial date in uh, 2021, first half of 2021. So um, there'll be lots of steps between now and then, and with the other two cases, we don't have a schedule yet, but um, it probably won't be super different. Are there any talks of settlement though? I kind of think the last time we had a press conference like this, there was the Oklahoma that just settled yes. with Purdue. So are you, how close? I, I mean, what I would say is that uh, conversations are happening. And that's what I would say. Uh, can you be a little more specific? Can you no, a little bit more work no right just uh, conversations are happening. Um, you know, I, I would just say to, to follow up on, on Bob's point, um, but we've done a lot of good things as a state to address this issue. Um, but last week, uh, I met with a family who lost a daughter um, to an overdose, fentanyl. And that's our challenge a a until no one, no one else dies. No one else gets started. That's our challenge. That may be an impossible goal, but that's our goal. Um, and we should uh, do everything we possibly can uh, to help those who are struggling with this addiction, which is a devastating, uh, powerful addiction, and we should do everything we can to prevent anybody from getting started. And that's you know what's gonna that's gonna take that's gonna take money. Let's be honest about that. That's gonna take money. And if we can't get it from the state, the state has done we've done good. Um, but we got to look for other sources. And then the question is how. Where does that money go? Where do we get our most bang for our buck? And so when we talk about these issues, I think we could be talking about the, the full landscape here um, in terms of prevention, in terms of treatment, acknowledging the work we've done as a state, acknowledging the work that the Howard Center has done. Uh, but to those parents who I met last week, their daughter's never coming back. Um, and this was somebody who started with prescription drugs, uh, transitioned to heroin, and who died as a result of a fentanyl overdose in our state. So this, this challenge is real. Uh, this challenge is ongoing. Uh, and for me, this is our priority uh, because we can do better. The uh, lawsuit today, uh, the court filing was in Chipman yes. Superior? Yes. As are the other lawsuits. And is it structured in the same way the other two where you have the outside, the outside law firm? Sorry, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Right. Same. Same law firm. Same law firm. Yeah. If there is a settlement, would it be based on per capita use or sales? Would Would some of those uh, Vermont trends be incorporated? We're having those conversations. Off topic. Sure. Um, we've got the state legislature looking towards adjournment. There's been a couple of bills um, that, that have caught people's attention. The gun bill and the abortion bill in particular. Do you anticipate any court uh, challenges to those bills? Um, I, I support both those bills. Um, uh, I, I hope the governor signs both of them. Um, yes, I think given uh, the legal challenge to the gun bill from last year. I would anticipate uh, another uh, legal challenge uh, as to the abortion uh, bill, which I, I support. I would anticipate a legal challenge, and we would vi vigorously defend both those bills should they become law. Well, with the abortion bill, um, you already got abortion in statute. I mean, what would a lawsuit mean? My father used to say, you can never prevent a lawsuit. You can prevent a good lawsuit, though. So I, I, we'll, we'll see what happens. On the uh, Douglas Hill one case in Burlington, has the office received the results of the investigation? Yes. The police and what's the status of any uh, timeline idea on when? No timeline. Uh, we have the investigation, and we're, re we're reviewing it. Thank you for coming. Thank you to Howard Center. Thank you. Thank you.